So as I said, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am very glad to uh, welcome you on this uh, webinar that will uh, focus on uh, understanding safety critical graphics solution for modern transportation markets. Um, first, I want really to thank uh, to thank you um, and to thank every uh, every of you. Uh, the number of uh, people that attend this uh, webinar is very uh, amazing uh, so uh, thank you for that uh, in same time i would like to thank you uh, christopher and robert that um, will assist me during this uh, this uh, webinar um, i am frederick maraval i am the product manager at uh, is it company our company uh, is uh, focused on uh, uh, real-time development tools and uh, software quality tools in uh, for embedded markets and we uh, represent uh, this operation and Cora VI in France. Um, and uh, Christopher and uh, Robert will uh, will do the technical or the more technical presentation about uh, this uh, this webinar. Um, don't worry, I know that my accent and my English is uh, sometimes very terrible, so I, I won't speak uh, too much. Uh, before to start, I will just you. Uh, give you some uh, general information uh, about the, the, this webinar. So the, the first is uh, that the, the session will be uh, recorded. Um, all attendees are muted. Uh, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. And we, you will be able to, to send your, your question through the question uh, chat you have on your control panel uh, normally. I hope that the connection is good enough for everybody to be able to hear us uh, clearly. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, send me uh, some uh, remarks if you have some trouble during the webinar through the, the chat window too. So the objective of this, uh, this webinar uh, is uh, how to design a safe and secure uh, uh, human interface uh, in embedded market and especially for critical uh, application, uh, how to take advantages about uh, modern platform, uh, CPU, GPU, and uh, new technology uh, for uh, designing this, uh, this GUI, uh, and uh, how to implement and deploy uh, such critical HMI uh, in a cost-effective uh, way. So we we will try to to attend and to achieve all this uh, this objective. Uh, we will start now. I give the ball to uh, to Bob. Thank you, Frederick. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Pickles. I'm with a company called Core VI, as mentioned by Frederick. Um, we are here to talk about safety critical graphics solutions for modern transportation markets. So, if we look at the agenda, I'm going to have an introduction on Core VI just to inform everyone about who we are, what we do, and what we're going to do in the future. We're going to look at market trends that are happening now and going to happen in the future and how we can meet those market trends with products that everyone can be can use for certifiable systems. We're also going to talk about Vulcan SC, uh, which is safety critical. We're going to have a look at the DISTI group, uh, sorry, DISTI GL Studio. We're going to then look at compositing, which might be interesting uh, for a whole range of market spaces um, to allow blending or merging of video streams and then we'll talk about our ARM partnership. So to introduce Core AVI, um, who are we and where do we come from? So we originally started um, in 2005 with a company called Channel One UK, which was into component obsolescence, providing 20 year component supply, especially for embedded GPUs. Um, they opened a US headquarters in 2008 in Tampa, Florida. And around about 2010, 2011, we acquired the IP of a company called Alt Software. So Alt Software were the number one AMD, uh, safety critical OpenGL supplier, software supplier 
um, until this time. So they had run about 15 years experience of safety certification. We also um, acquired their employees, their engineers. So we we had a good start with um, a, a ready-made team of s certification experts in the engineering pool that we acquired from Oak Software. So the product portfolio we can see is OpenGLSC graphics and video drivers. Uh, we need video drivers because we have different hardware, different RTOSs and so on. Yeah, uh, we have we support most of the premium RTOSs as well as Windows, Linux, and the usual. Um, so we have a number of DO178 certification packages. This leads on to other markets for automotive, transportation, and industrial. And we also still supply um, temperature screened embedded GPUs for 20 years of life. So it's important obsolescence again. 2017, we rolled out COTS D primarily because we had to certify the GPUs from a hardware perspective. Um, so we we acquired a pool of engineers who could design and build boards, graphics boards, as well as uh, CPU boards. And the intention was to provide a hardware IP, intellectual property. So we provide the know-how where you can then build the device or board in your own manufacturing plant, and we support you through the entire project with certification artifacts. That's the key goal of COTS-D. 2018, uh, we we have a new uh, generation of SageQuery graphics library. This is really aimed at graphics and compute combined. So OpenGL was simply graphics. Vulkan SC is aimed directly at compute and graphics. So we're also on the board of Kronos, which is an organization that maintains the open standards for all for many of the of the graphics and compute libraries available now, including OpenGL, OpenCL. So by working with the Open Group at Kronos, we defined the next generation of Vulkan safety critical. So there's a Vulkan commercial with no safety aspect and Vulkan safety critical with a safety cert API. And we also in 2020 launched our first compute core libraries, which are aimed at embedded vision. Uh, with Kronos compliance for OpenGL as well. So this is the story so far. So we're really pushing towards OpenGL compatibility and compute for embedded vision. We have a number of offices worldwide um, support as well worldwide. So you can see the blue the blue items are the Corivea offices. You can see that we're based in Waterloo and a couple in the US. So all of the engineering and development and design occurs in Canada, which means that all of our products are ARTAR free, which is very important for some of our military customers. Um, so we also have regional support in Europe and Africa, South America, as well as Asia and Australia. This is an interesting presentation slide because if you look at the top right hand corner we can see the number of systems that we've been involved in so we've actually certified almost 172 safety critical systems that's certified flying in the air at the moment hopefully driving in the ground as well in the future so around about 60 known aircraft are flying with our solutions now that's commercial aircraft military aircraft um, and we now have another 42 systems in progress at the moment. What's also interesting is we did actually have more than this in progress, but 10 were completed earlier this year, and we added another 10 this year. So you can see that we have a big experience in safety certification. We work closely with a number of partners. I hope you recognize most of them. Obviously, one of the most important ones today is DISTI because we're providing a webinar with DISTI. So we're going to look at some market trends, which might be interesting. Um, so we're, we're trying to cover all of the markets and um, to show that we can we can provide solutions for all of the markets. So embedded vision is the biggest market trend at the moment where use of GPU shader cores are used to create on the fly effects such as target recognition. It could be instead of an aircraft, it could be a, a, an object like a dog on the, the pathway or a person or another car in front of us or behind us. 
So we can provide target outline, object detection, blur contrast, and many other effects like FFT, um, which might be used in other systems as well as a primary algorithm for sensor detection. This also leads to a number of capabilities that are actually being used at the moment with uh, see-through capabilities. Uh, using cameras and GPU shaders, for example, if you imagine a helicopter pilot in the desert or in a bushfire and they're trying to land on the ground and they can't see below the helicopter, then a, a mounted display on the goggle would allow see-through capabilities to see through the aircraft using cameras to see the obstructions on the ground to ensure that he can land safely. It's a very interesting technique that may be used for other applications in automotive, transportation and so on. Another concept which is fairly unknown is windowless aircraft, uh, which is coming now. So if you imagine passengers are looking outside the, dis outside the window, but it's actually a, a display which has been fed with a camera. So this is things that are changing. They're actually doing tests on this now on, on certain air aircraft companies in the Far East, I think. Um, and this will be coming to aircraft fairly soon once the prototypes have been established. Other areas uh, with respect to automotive, we've seen a lot of this stuff uh, at the trade shows like augmented uh, displays with rear view mirrors with camera feeds so you can see around you, see behind you, see in front of you as well. Uh, side mirrors that are camera fed which allow you to do things like have night vision in the cameras so you can see what's actually behind you. Um, and also windshields with graphical capabilities such as intelligent or smart glass where you can see data on the windshield so you don't actually need a head-up display anymore it's actually the, the smarter and the challenging glass is actually showing the data on the windshield without obstructing the view ahead as you're driving so one of the things that is leading the market is compute so we need compute for embedded uh, vision, um, but it's been hit around since 2004. If we look at a project known as the Low Level Virtual Machine .org link here, you'll find you could read more about this there. So it's been around for a long time. People have been trying to use it for a long time, but it's really come to a momentum now where everybody wants to use it for um, machine learning, neural networks, and so on. So most SOCs already have a GPU embedded within them. So Vulkan is allowing access to those GPUs, a very powerful and low-level access, which allows us to do things like uh, smart displays on cars. So it also opens up a number of areas that might be interesting for many industries, such as massive parallel processing using GPU cores. So you have a host processor and a GPU processor. Uh, maybe a thousand processing cores running different algorithms. And of course, this is really useful for intelligence or deep machine learning, as well as embedded neural networks. So advanced driver assistance systems, which we need for the next level of autonomous cars or semi-autonomous cars or hybrid autonomous cars, if you like. And of course, we can use these um, camera feeds to detect if the driver is actually feeling a bit fatigued and give them some warning signs, or we can even use them for outside to provide assisted braking and so on, yeah, based on the environment outside and inside. So Vulcan SC, this is a, a product overview, of what we provide, the baselines, if you like. But let's ask, what is Vulcan? There may be some people that don't actually know what Vulcan is and where it's coming from. So in essence, it's the next generation graphics and Compute API. It's highly efficient. It's cross-platform because we want to run, a, run a Vulkan on a number of different devices, such as mobile phones, all the way up to high-end display systems and GPU compute systems. Um, so Vulkan is widely used on commercial applications, including high-performance gaming, which is where the requirement came from. So the gamers have been using OpenGL for a long time, and they couldn't really get the performance for the new level of advanced gaming. So they need a new graphics API to allow graphics and compute together to allow low level control of the GPU. So Vulk has been around since probably 2016. So it's starting to, be, to mature. So most of the GPU suppliers such as AMD, NVIDIA, Arm, Imagination, Vivanti, Intel and others 
I'm moving to Vulkan. Every single one of those has a Vulkan page on the website. And you never know, Vulkan might even replace OpenGL, OpenCL, and CUDA in the future. If you want to know more about Vulkan, there is a web link at the bottom to Kronos.org. So they maintain the open standard for Vulkan and Vulkan SC. So what do we offer as part of um, Core AVI's VK Core SC, which is our name for Vulkan, safety critical? So we provide a product or um, an option called VK Core GL, which allows legacy OpenGL customers who don't want to use the Vulkan API or compute to actually use VK Core GL like it's an OpenGL library, the way they use it already. So that allows existing customers with older GPU applications to move or merge to the latest, ver latest version of Vulkan. We also provide a Vulkan safety critical API, so you can actually access the API directly and do graphics independently of the OpenGL. You can also use the compute interface to create shader compute and kernel compute. So shared computes more about OpenGL shared language and creating effects like embedded vision. So you're manipulating images and changing the output of the display on the fly using GPU cores and shared compute. We also have kernel compute where you can download your algorithms just like OpenCL and CUDA and, and use the GPU to process those algorithms. Now that's a key concept and be what we're aiming for is safety critical. So if we look at all of the industries now, where we have to be involved with safety. We'll look at aerospace, automotive, transportation, trains, uh, and industrial. As part of that, we also provide product called TrueCore, which is a GPU safety monitor, which is run as a separate uh, built-in test library that be, can be called by the application layer to check the OpenGL or the Vulkan progress through the hardware of the GPU to ensure that no parts are failing in the GPU. We also provide encode core, decode core, which is a software API to allow encoding and decoding of H.264 and 265 video streams using the GPU's uh, registers on board. We also provide video capture. Um, so this is a a facility or a, an option we provide to allow uh, customers a way of capturing different video streams. So it could be a, a video stream for an FPGA, it could be a video stream for another um, another computer, it could be a video stream for from an RNK18 stream or a, an SDHDI stream. Um, there's many different configurations on a system that could be captured, even a MIPI interface capture if it's automotive. So the Vulkan SC library, um, we can see here, we've mentioned the options already. There's a driver with a GPU virtualization manager, as well as um, other, other features such as multi-core, multi-threading, and compositing embedded within the same driver and GPU manager. We can see that the application layer has access to the API, the Vulkan SC API directly. So it can, it can also, at the same time as using the Vulkan SE API, also run an application in an OpenGL library. And it can also run a safety monitor to ensure that the whole process is running as expected to provide built-in test errors where errors occur. And you can see the other options, video capture, encode, decode. One important aspect to this is that Kronos require all of the the OpenGL and Vulkan suppliers to run one of their uh, utility scripts to ensure the API is conforming to Kronos API. So we we did this in January, so we've now proven to Kronos and they've agreed that it's now run through their API to prove that our VK Core GLSC 101 is conforming to the open standard that Kronos is providing to the industry. So Vulkan supports um, a number of CPU, GPUs. Uh, we have other libraries that support legacy GPUs that customers are currently using at the moment. Um, so we're not going to cover those here. We're just going to cover Vulkan and what Vulkan supports. 
So the main one is the AMG, AMD E9171 GPU, known as Polaris 12, which is five display ports. Um, I don't think we've seen a system using all five yet, but five display ports are available. Um, the total design power of this device is 35 watts, so it's fairly powerful. Um, this has eight compute unit work units available with 16 wave fronts. Now, in AMD speak, the wave fronts are basically um, 16 wave fronts, each with their own program counters. So that means there's 16 parallel streams uh, working on a maximum 1024 work, work units per stream. Um, and if you multiply the 8 by 16, you get 128 programmable or or individual parallel wave fronts running at the same time, working on their 1,024 work units maximum, which is it's starting to look look like a big number, like 131k work units possible inside a GPU running at the same time as you have a host processor that's controlling the GPU. So the numbers are quite interesting from a, a compute aspect and a com machine learning aspect. We also support the Vivanti GC7000XS VX. It's very important, this one, because this is the only Vivanti we support, because this is the, the one that provides the best GPU and the, the one that can provide the best performance. If you look at the other Vivanti GPUs, they don't provide the best performance. This one is living on, well, there's two of these on the i.mx8 QM from, um, from NX, NXP. So we chose that device because of performance aspects. So we can see there's four HDMI, which is spelled incorrectly. <laughs> this should be HDMI, um, running at 1080p, um, and or one display port. Now it depends if you have MIPI or LVDS configured, so you may lose some HDMI, which takes away the display port facility, depending on your configuration. So interestingly, the Vivanti is only one watt of of power. So if there's two in the M idle MX8, that's two watts approximately, depending what the GPU cores are doing. The Vanti also has eight shader cores available for um, shaders and compute as well. So if you would like to evaluate Vulcan SC with either the AMD E9171 card or the NXP idle MX8 board, you can actually evaluate it on Windows and Linux on a number of different platforms. This is the NXP MEK board. Uh, this is a PC-based board, PC Express, and this is a VPX board. So we actually have two options here, VPX and XMC, if you want to run it uh, on a Milero type solution on Windows and Linux or another RTOS of choice. So let's look at this GL Studio. So Corey VI has been working with DISTI uh, for a number of years now on different markets. You can see the markets we cover. Um, so we can see that um, we're looking at an automotive display on the right, or displays on the right. So GL Studio allows, pr provides a GUI builder using user-defined components, dials and digits and text and so on, and produces OpenGL SC, Sage Critical Source Code, generation of runtime libraries to actually display these at runtime, yeah? So this is the markets that this year are involved in, and they also provide CERT, HMI, or UI displays, that's human machine interface and user interface displays. So Core VI offers OpenGL SC1 and 2 to allow the OpenGL SC source code generated by DISD Studio to run in the application there. We also provide the RTOS for the driver for the GPU, cert artifacts for the project, and cert support during the project certification, which is a very, very important point of our package solution. We just don't just leave you running with the product, we support you through the certification. So if we look at the system level from a, an application viewpoint to see how uh, DISTI and Core AVI operate with their packages. We can see that GL Studio generates the OpenGL SC or ES code uh, that's then running with the application there. Um, 
Core EVI is providing the Vulkan library, which includes the OpenGL SC component to allow the disk to OpenGL to access the Vulkan driver. The Vulkan driver is then accessing the GPU to allow the display that you see on the right. So compositing. So compositing allows multiple frame buffers or layers of frame buffers to be displayed in the same display, uh, like graphical layers, or we also call it blending of, of video streams or images. So we can see the process is combining visual elements from separate sources into a single image or video frame. You can see I have a critical display layer, a non-critical layer, might have some animation with some uh, some gadgets to make everyone feel good about the display. Because if we just looked at the pure safety critical aspect, it may be a little bit boring. So this is where the entertainment value applies. But this is non-safety cert and must live with this safety cert layer. So the way that it works is we blend or we merge the displays using a, a compositor. With OpenGL, there is an embedded graphics library that's matched to the OpenGL that provides this facility. Uh, so this is an extension to the standard EGL. It's known as EGL EXT Compositor. Uh, there's a web link here to show you where you can see more information about it. And Core EVI provides capability with, with Vulkan SC to allow you to do compositing, which is a nice uh, feature. So if we look at the OpenGL library, um, it's interesting to see that OpenGL has no concept of the physical hardware, such as the GPU or display or keyboards or mice or anything. Yeah, OpenGL renders simply to frame buffers and GPU memory. So it's the embedded graphics library that implements the device screen rendering. So EGL is managed by the Kronos group. Uh, so it's an open standard software library. So for compositing, we use EGL 1.4 which allows a primary context and non-displayable context to be merged together as one display, like a blending of displays. So we can see this primary, the secondary, two secondary contexts uh, being composited onto a final display using it EGL. To give you some more input into this, we can see OpenGL application one, two, three. So one's going to be a primary application, in other words, safety critical application, and the other word, ones are non-critical, but they may have some criticality. And using this DGL Studio and the GUI Builder, you can use this to composite all three into a display at the end and run you're using your runtime application. So let's look at a quick compositing example uh, whereby we're going to have two applications on a, a real time OS, like partitioned. We can see one application running OpenGLSC from perhaps uh, DISD, uh, GL Studio. We can have another application which is running a video capture option that we provided. And they're using a kernel mode driver on the RTOS to access the Vivanti GPU which is the G CG7000. So if we look at the IDO MX8QM, it provides six processors, two A53s, two A72s. And different RTOS configurations can allow different aspects of this. So they can allow all the CPUs, or may only allow four or two C or pro ARM cores. It depends on the RTOS. So if we look at the video interface, the video capture, we, this time we're looking at PCIe, but it could be any any source from a, a known standard, a MIPI interface, um, HDSDI interface. It could be some other device that has a video stream that's not even linked to PCIe. It might be a memory-based device using the shared memory window. So we can see that using the video capture option, the video is coming in from the device, which could be FPGA or a computer system. Uh, it's coming through the video capture using a compositor, which is part of Vulkan, and the OpenGL application, which is a critical part. Also using the compositor, we can then build the display on the, on the GPU. So each GPU supports two HDI, HDMIs, 
and has eight cores per GPU. So that means if we're running one GPU with a video capture routine, we could also maybe use another GPU for other access or another video display or even for compute, which is interesting. So final slide is about the ARM partnership that Core EVI have since October 2019. So it's interesting because ARM are due to announce another um, ARM Mali next generation um, today, but we can't talk about it because they haven't announced it until after this webinar is, is started. So we can just, we can provide more information after this webinar. So Core EVI are to provide safety critical graphic solutions for ARM, next gen automotive systems, Core EVI's VK Core SC will be available where required for SC automotive systems and will support the next generation of ARM Mali. You can see the different Mali's that are available now if you look at the ARM website. So typically next generation Mali's are typically 25% step and performance between each models in the past. The architecture is based on a Valhal GPU architecture and the focus is on graphics and machine learning. So that's going to use compute there for that aspect. So unfortunately we couldn't give you more information on the ARM partnership, but we can provide an update maybe next week after we're allowed to provide more information. So that's my presentation for today. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Christopher, so he can then go through his presentation on uh, DISTI, for DISTI and GeoStudio. Thanks a lot, Bob. Really appreciate it. Uh, great presentation. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you see that okay? You can see yeah, that fine. Yeah. Okay, okay. perfect. So my name is Chris Giordano, I'm from the DISTI Corporation. Um, my portion of this presentation is going to step up the graphics stack a little bit to talk more about uh, the development and workflow of the graphical user interface, uh, but in a safety critical manner. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and start out by uh, giving you a real brief introduction to DISTI. Uh, so we were actually founded in 1994. We started out doing simulation and training uh, visuals, uh, building out cockpits for air, uh, aircraft mostly, uh, flight simulators, uh, and very quickly that led us to creating uh, embedded real-time uh, code generation capability for functional safety displays in real aircraft. Uh, so that started roughly a few years after uh, our, our uh, initial establishment. So you fast forward to today, we've got over 700 companies using GL Studio around the world. Uh, we're actually in, over in uh, 47 countries now, not that I'm counting, but, um, and we are very highly specialized in HMI, human machine interface, the graphical portion of, uh, of your application. Everything you see and touch and interface with uh, including our functional safety background. So if we take a look at some of our select customer lists, you'll notice everybody on there from defense agencies to NASA to aircraft and medical device manufacturers, tractor manufacturers, uh, and of course in automotive as well. So we are in production with all of these companies uh, for a number of different programs. Uh, in, in fact, uh, some, some good examples of production would be between automotive, uh, Hyundai Mobis, Hyundai Kia Motors has adopted us for instrument clusters, heads up displays. Uh, we were standardized on at Jaguar Land Rover for in vehicle infotainment for all of their car models, uh, at both Jaguar and Land Rover. Uh, we're now in production, uh, in the agriculture industry with scent tractors and Topcon displays. Uh, we've also recently announced a large-scale adoption by Boeing for the new T-7A Red Hawk, which is the next-generation trainer jet uh, that Boeing is producing. So this is all for the embedded safety-critical graphics in the avionics, as well as the desktop training system. Uh, and likewise, next generation of 
supersonic aircraft from Boom Supersonic has also adopted GL Studio throughout the entire life cycle of their production from prototyping to human factors simulators, training simulators, and actually embedded graphics in the real aircraft. So this gives you kind of an idea of the world that we've come from and the type of work that we have done. Uh, in order to make this happen, we have to have some really solid partner ecosystem. Uh, we've worked with just about every RTOF uh, manufacturer that's out there. We have a number of, of hardware partners and technical, uh, of course, including Core AVI on the driver's side. Um, and actually, uh, in, in discussion with ARM, we were the, uh, the, the very first GUI tool to be invited as a charter member to the ARM Automotive Developer uh, Community, which was a pretty big honor. Um, we have done a lot of work with different standards committees over the last years. Uh, um, and of course, with all of our uh, functional safety certifications, we've done quite a bit between the FDA, the FAA, and uh, Tube Nord on the automotive side. So we're going to start to talk a little bit more about the importance of functional safety, especially as it uh, pertains to the transportation sector and, and automotive sector. So when we take a look at functional safety, um, it's all about software reliability. And software reliability can be a very good thing, um, but it can also uh, be a very bad thing in some cases. Um, and if you're not developing appropriately, it can cause serious problems, uh, catastrophic errors, the wrong code, the, the tools that are unsafe uh, can lead to death. And that's the ultimate goal of functional safety is to make a safer system, okay? So when you start looking at the increase in, in complexity in automobiles, uh, you've got the onset of different ADAS features, lane departure warning, adaptive follow, park, park assist, uh, or adaptive cruise control and park assist. This is all leading towards autonomy, but we're not gonna get there overnight. There's gonna be a slow buildup to autonomy, which means there will be pure AVs on the road at the same time, or there's still old vehicles that have old technology on the road. And so those vehicles will need to be all developed in a very safe and secure way. So when we start to take a look at, uh, don't mean to scare you with the last slide, but, but the key with that slide is, as, as catastrophic as these crashes can be, the software industry in particular learns from them and we get better from them, and the technology continues to get better. If you look at this study from Statistica, just between the year 2017 and 2018, the percentage of people who think that driving self-driving cars, riding in self-driving cars will not be safe, has significantly decreased, significantly decreased. This is definitely pointing us down the road of autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are loaded with software and really just demand functional safety. Um, so when we look at why is functional safety important, right? Um, again, first and foremost, it's to avoid a catastrophe. It's to save lives, okay? Um, functional safety and security are inextricably linked to each other. If you want a secure car that can't be hacked, well, your functional safety system is going to be able to bring about the reliability uh, in that subsystem that you've developed. It will really bring about trust in the brands, in the different vehicle brands, um, which is what we're starting to see with the previous slide, with people starting to be able to trust the technology more, right? Um, so in order to make this a successful uh, endeavor, you really need to start out with a safety plan and a safety culture at your company. Uh, safety culture has to do with making sure everything gets done the right way, the same way, every time, according to how you design your safety plan. Uh, and you really just need to expect the unexpected in your safety plan. Uh, you, you, you don't always know what to code for, but if you take the worst case scenario, and you design that into what your safety plan is going to be, all cases can certainly be handled. Um, so when you start to look at cost savings and functional safety, now you, you might think that the more software that's going into this vehicle, 
the more expensive it can be. Well, the, the key that you have to look at is a lot of these other tools, commercial tools that are on the market, have already uh, taken into account the sunken cost of functional safety. So you look at Core AVI, for example, they've been doing this for decades. They're expert in their field. They have all of these components in place already. Likewise, so does DISTI. Likewise, so do a number of these different RTOS companies that we've worked with, right? So the goal there when you're trying to minimize your cost is find the right tools that already handle this stuff natively and implement them properly. Then you can also minimize your hardware costs by architecting appropriately up front. Um, and so when you have the right tools in place and you have the right architecture in place, this allows you to be massively scalable and portable so that you can design one architecture that can be used across multiple models, multiple uh, sub-brands uh, and displays and display sizes and different aspect ratios and how you're going to interface with it. Uh, so it's really just about designing smart up front, more of an object model based approach. So if we step down a layer to take a look specifically at the HMI or the user interface, Brands today are really in a race to the best looking AI, right? So everybody wants every feature they can possibly imagine in their vehicle. All the manufacturers want to be able to put it in their vehicle. It's not always safe just to drop everything in there uh, because you'll have distractions, you'll have driver distraction. So as long as the vehicle is not pure EV, which is still going to be for a while as we morph into what a pure EV will be, uh, there still needs to be design taken into account in a functionally safe way, okay? Uh, brands need to iterate very, very quickly in order to stay on top of making sure their brand is consistent and that it's doing more than what their competitors do. So we've seen things where our customers need to be able to iterate right up until a few months before they actually go to deploy their graphics into uh, production, uh, which if you design your system correctly, the graphical layer that just sits on top can easily be adjusted to, to accommodate those, especially when you have automated processes that are known to be reliable and functionally safe, okay? So uh, another need for, uh, for the brand racing to that best UI is to drive down the cost. And one way to drive down the cost is have uh, a multi-display single SOC solution, uh, a way to be able to have a single SOC running as many displays as you need. Um, that's a much more powerful uh, of a capability. So uh, essentially what you need here is the UI tools that require functional safety and non-functional safety. You need to be able to accommodate a singular process, a single development path that can encompass the exact same tool chains uh, that you'd use for your cluster, your HUD, your IVI, um, but that still can contain functional safety development processes and procedures. So this need for mixed criticality, as we call it, continues to grow as you start to see more and more uh, manufacturers going down the path of having a single SOC running uh, multiple displays. Some displays require functional safety, some do not. Um, so on top of that, when it comes to functional safety with HMI, we also still need to see a single standards authority uh, put in place. So currently the, the rec, the Functional safety standards are really recommendations that can be interpreted by each individual OEM and the tier ones that are doing the development. Uh, but at that, there is no one single regional authority that mandates anything uh, at this point other than making the recommendations. Uh, very different than what we see in aerospace, uh, for example, or in nuclear facilities, for example. Uh, but, but the one thing that is pretty constant is the fact that we know functional safety is not going anywhere. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the onset of autonomous vehicles and the, 
the move from a purely manned vehicle to a purely autonomous vehicle, along that continuum, there is still going to need to be a way to functionally safely interact with the vehicle. So that brings us to this mixed criticality concept and, and how do we move forward with mixed criticality. So as Bob highlighted earlier, um, if we take a look at what, what mixed criticality means from a UI perspective, from the higher level perspective, it's really about blending of a uh, safety critical layer with a standard EF layer. And the, the primary reason for this is the safety layer always needs to be able to draw last and consistently and the same. Uh, but one of the reasons why we are moving down the path of mixed criticality has to do with the design infrastructure that a lot of the OEMs in tier ones are using. Everybody wants to be able to have very complex uh, visual data, 2D, 3D data, complex animations on their screens, on their clusters, their HUDs, infotainment. And a lot of times when you have functional safety content, you'll see that uh, people need to define a blanked out or a black strip on their display to say, this is where our functional safety content's gonna draw, it can't move, you can't do anything other than turn it on or turn it off and we can validate that it works. Uh, well, if you architect this appropriately, you can actually have full reliability in your safety layer and still full flexibility in your graphical capability. Uh, with the inclusion of 3D content, animations, complex 3D uh, animated layers as well. And so that's the path that we go down. But there are certainly challenges to mixed criticality, uh, none of which are insurmountable. So there's the compositing graphics, uh, taking QM and ACIL content, putting this together. Um, your software architecture can allow for this, as we saw earlier with Bob's presentation, and the compositing capability that they have as well. Uh, so requirements, testing, validation, verification, and traceability is all really uh, challenging to do from a composited layer standpoint, but if it's architected appropriately, not impossible. Uh, so functional safety systems are for the entire system, not just the individual parts. When, when companies like DISTI, or like Core ABI, or perhaps like Green Hills for your uh, RTOS, or maybe QNX come to you and say, we've been certified. What that really means is we've been pre-certified or used in another certification system or a system that's been certified to some level, which gives you the confidence that we can pass this certification again if you're utilizing the same architecture, okay? Certification is about the system, not the parts, not the pieces. Uh, of course, certification on Linux can be challenging. You're not working with something that is a real-time operating system. It's not deterministic. You can't always guarantee when something happens with Linux. Um, there are real-time Linuxes that are out there, uh, but uh, Linux can be a challenge. Um, also, the standard in automotive for ISO 26262 it's still very much of a young standard. And so there's a lack of experience out there, although it's very quickly growing. We're starting to see loads of industry experts popping up, and a lot of them are coming from different industries, such as aerospace, such as nuclear, that really have a firm grasp on how functional safety works. Um, the key here, though, is that the hardware then becomes a single point of failure. And so how do you handle hardware failure? If you have a single SOC, right? Um, now, there are mechanisms for doing that. Um, the standards and practices, of course, they're getting better as the ISO 26262 continues to iterate and be re released. I think we're on Rev 2 now, uh, if not Rev 3, coming up shortly. Um, and of course, uh, one of the biggest challenges is that there is a lack of a singular certified certifying authority. Um, very different than what we see in, again, in aviation, for example. Plane will not fly until the system's been certified by the FAA, the JAA, or the CAA to very well-defined and specific uh, functional safety standards. 
So when we look at what that means from a UI perspective, what do you actually need? Well, you need support in your UI tools for both QM and for ASIL. Uh, you need your commercial tools that already have some level of reliability, scalability. Um, you need to be able to contain your costs, right? There is a, a notion in the, in the market that functional safety uh, is more expensive. Well, that's not necessarily true if you take into account that a lot of these tools already have the sunken cost of developing this capability for you, okay? Uh, support for, again, the multi-display single SOC. So there's already tools that are proven to be able to handle this type of capability. You need a UI tool that gives you very high performance content that can run multiple displays from a single SOC, as well as a more powerful SOC to be able to handle all of the different inputs and outputs coming from several displays. Uh, and this, this really allows you to take advantage of a lot of the latest hardware that's out there. Uh, NXP, for example, has a great one with the IMX8 that Bob was talking about earlier, and I'm gonna actually bring that up here uh, shortly. So mixed criticality really can meet all of these different demands. Right, it's just a function of how do you implement it. And so that brings us to um, a demonstration that we were able to show during CES and Embedded World of this year. So this technology is available and viable today. Uh, it, it already exists. So we were able to show a mixed criticality, one-touch workflow where you can iterate onto the target in under 60 seconds from a single HMI design, where that single design houses both safety critical content, or ASIL, and ES content, or QM, in the same design file. From that point, you're iterating and pushing out to your target, you're iterating and pushing out to your desktop, you have one easy to use customizable workflow that generates two completely separate applications that in turn become composited together on your safety capable hardware. Now the one touch deployment is a, a script based file that we attach inside of the GL Studio tools, for example, that allow you to automate this process so that anybody can utilize this process. You don't need to be a coder to use this process only to merely set it up for somebody else to use. So when we take a look at mixed criticality in, in, in practice, right, again, we have the ability already to create these complex 3D animations in the background. A lot of tools can do that. But what a lot of tools can't do is, in parallel, create that safety layer that sits on top of it and auto-generate both of those layers so that they can be composited together to target. And that's a real big, powerful piece of what we were able to show in our live demonstration. So the architecture from the graphical standpoint, uh, again, a step above what Core ABI was just showing, um, has to do with us running on our IMX8, uh, that was the Quad Max MEK. The demonstration is running Green Hills uh, virtualized hardware um, with our Integrity RTOS, and of course on the safety stack, We've got multiple stacks here. One was a safety stack, and that can run the Core AVI SC graphics drivers. And then on the standard ES stacks, we're looking at running pretty much whatever operating system you need. But in the case of our example, we were running either Yocto Linux or Android. And so then those push out to the displays using a compositor for the SC and the standard uh, embedded QM content. Uh, and then pushing directly out with a bi-directional communication for the infotainment or the center stack display. So this was a very effective, uh, very effective iteration cycles and workflow efficiency demonstration where we were able to iterate in under 60 seconds, make changes to the displays and run them both on Windows uh, or Linux, but we ran it on Windows for the demonstration and out to the embedded target at the same time. So what's the benefit for this? Well, your workflow efficiencies, you have a much faster time to market. You can iterate and iterate and iterate uh, and, and finally get the appropriate look and feel that you're looking for much further down the line with a more consistent 
uh, and stable development workflow, uh, you can really future-proof your UI tech. So uh, for, for our case, we actually provide access to source code, uh, how the source code is generated, the source code for the runtime. This means that in five or six years, if you need some capability that we don't yet support, you can add it yourself, we can add it through our package-based system, uh, but the key is you're not locked out of any future capabilities. You're really future-proofing your user interfaces. And of course, all of this together really helps you lower your bill of material. Uh, you're able to use less ECUs, uh, so less hardware costs. Uh, you're able to have a better runtime performance, which means you don't need as capable of hardware in order to get the same display capabilities, uh, or you can utilize that extra display uh, capability further down the pipe for other future enhancements to the vehicle. So very exciting times for us at Embedded World uh, and at uh, CES earlier. So that brings us to, uh, well, what are the benefits then for the partnership, for, for example, between Core AVI and DISTI? Well, the biggest piece of what we bring to market for our customers is that we have pre-configured solutions and architectures that we've demonstrated together that they can work. Uh, you've probably seen both our companies at, uh, at different trade shows. Uh, well, not recently, but <laughs> uh, earlier in the year and, and with many years past, you've seen both of our companies uh, in different trade shows, showing each other's technology, showing that this solution does work. Both companies have decades of experience in functional safety um, and quality implementation, safety implementation, and we've got the ability to go in and help people through their certification. Uh, we don't just drop, you, drop off the technology and say, that's not our part, good luck. We come in and we actually help you go through uh, your certification capability, much like what Core, I, Core ADI does at the driver level uh, further down the stack. Um, so we've been proven in, in uh, over 120 different programs to this date. Uh, and we've got a very long, rich history in, in, in HMI and user interfaces, uh, but also in functional safety. And it's really about our partnership bringing the best possible reliability, safety, and runtime performance to our customer base. So uh, if you're interested, uh, we've actually just recently released a new paper on autonomous vehicles called Will Autonomous Vehicles Ever Be Safe? Uh, you can download this actually from the link below on the left-hand side. Uh, we start getting into uh, automotive safety integrity levels, talk more detail about mixed criticality and the levels of autonomy, um, and also functional safety in autonomous vehicles and what that morphing over time will start to look like as more autonomous vehicles start coming on the road and less, um, less manned, purely manned vehicles start coming off the road. So please feel free to, uh, to download that, and we, we look forward to talking with you more on that. And so at this point, I will hand it back over to Frederick, and uh, we'll take some questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Great presentation. And uh, let's start effectively the Q&A uh, session. So uh, use the question chat window in order to, to ask uh everything you you want to know about uh this presentation to christopher to to robert uh so don't be shy and ask your question um i would just wait some second to see the question that uh, are arriving and we'll start okay um so first first question uh as i know that my english is not so good i will Copy and paste everything in the chat window so everybody can see it. So first question, I think maybe for you, Bob, or any in any case, Christopher, if you want to comment, be free to do. What is the the difference between uh, uh, CUDA and Vulkan for compute? 
Uh, the primary difference is that uh, Vulkan is an open standard, so it run on different types of hardware. It's a uh, Vulkan SE is safety certifiable compute. Whereas Vulkan, so as CUDA can only run on NVIDIA hardware, um, and CUDA as of yet has not been certifiable because it's not an open standard. Uh, it's a proprietary standard by NVIDIA. That's the main difference. So there's okay. no information for certification. Okay, thank you. Okay, another one. So same. Uh, so uh, what graphical element and effect can be used on the safety layer? Is that for me or for Chris? Both the one that one to to answer our comment. Sure. Well, I guess I can take a stab at that. It um, it really kind of depends on what you mean by graphical elements. I'm assuming they're meaning what kind of uh, what kind of special features can you use? Um, probably like pixel shaders, bump mapping, complex animation. Uh, from from the GL Studio side of it, at, at the top level graphical layer. Um, we've worked with all different types of animation tools. Um, we've worked with things like um, uh, 3D Studio Max animation, uh, OBJ files coming out of Maya animations, um, and then, of course, uh, Adobe After Effects, which you can use to create animations. All these things can be uh, directly imported right into the tool chain so that you can then manipulate those animations in a visible way. Uh, and if you're talking about things like pixel shaders, bump mapping, uh, specialized graphical techniques, um, GL Studio really allows you to utilize any of that through a package-based system where you can uh, either use some of our pre-configured shaders uh, to create your own effects, um, or you can actually create your own and include them into the package base so that you can distribute them throughout your entire project let other developers use it. So I'm not quite sure if it's one or the other, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure between those two, I may have been able to answer that question for him, Frederick. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is for both of you. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the, the maximum uh, safety, I think, safety level you can, uh, you can reach? Ah. Um, well, from the GL Studio side, we have uh, already been pre-certified to ACLD uh, through Tooth Nord, and we actually just received our recertification uh, late last year. Um, and then from the from the other markets, we've we've gone through DO178B up to level A. Uh, we're developed for DO178C level A. Um, we've been through. Uh, medical certs, rail certs. So we, we've got quite, quite, quite a background in that, as I'm sure uh, Bob does as well. Yeah, so from our point of view, um, we have the capabilities to certify our software in aerospace to the very highest levels, and also in automotive and transportation uh, using functional safety standards. Uh, but we typically choose a GPU or CPU or, or system on chip manufacturers that would provide the hardware artifacts that allow us to certify the hardware at the same time. So, for example, NXP and the IDO MX8 provide a package which provides, I think, ASO, ASO, ASO B on the on the IDO MX8. We then add to that package to make it higher. Yeah, ASO D in the end. Um, the same with uh, transportation. We do the same with the AMD devices, which can be certified up to the very highest levels from a hardware and software perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can add one more thing to that, Bob, um, if you go back to one thing we were talking about earlier, it really depends on the entire system. Even though the, the components, like what Core AVI does and what DISC does, uh, can be essentially pre-certified or in other certification systems. It's about the entire system, um, which which brings you back to selecting all of the parts. Yeah, system requirements as well, very important. Okay, thank you. 
Um, the next one is for you, Christopher. Um, how are you able to have OpenGL ES and OpenGL SC in the same design file? Yeah, so that's something kind of unique to GL Studio because we are a code generator. Um, we actually have uh, separate code generators for ES and SC and separate runtime libraries that are appropriate. So in the GL Studio design frame, uh, you can tag different objects to be safety critical capable objects. Uh, and then at code generation time, the GL Studio tool set recognizes that and uses the appropriate code generator and runtime library to produce the two separate applications. One is ACL, one is QM, that then end up getting composited back together for the final display. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one, uh, there are so many I have to select. Uh, the next one is for you, Bob. Um, Do you have any customer already using Core Every product uh, in certification project outside of aerospace and automotive? Um, we're we're in the process of certif of certifying one project at the moment in automotive, and we have other ones in transportation and industrial that we're looking at now, as well as aerospace. So, yes, we have we have a few customers. <clears throat> okay. Uh, maybe another one uh, for you, Christopher. Uh, in the challenge slide, you mentioned that the left there are a lake of uh, singular certifying authority. Um, could you explain more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, when you look at the aviation industry, for example, um, you know an aircraft. It just will not fly unless the systems processes are certified by the FAA, JA, or the CAA, depending on what region you're in. Um, you know, those standards were all jointly developed and worked on by Safety Working Group for RTCA and EuroK, um, which eventually became released as documents for DO178B and then C, and uh, EuroK ED12B and then C. Those are well defined paths. And those uh, authorities basically say, you're not flying your aircraft in commercial space until we approve that that system and your design and your safety case uh, is all following the appropriate uh, procedures and has been tested, verified, and validated by a third party entity. Um, I think right now in automotive, it's a bit different because you look at the uh, ISO 26262 standard, it's still relatively young, well, only about eight or nine years old at this point. It just reached its second rev, what, last year, I think? Um, and so it's still really just a recommendation. Uh, and people still do follow it, and it's got great recommendations in there. But the key is that there's no single certifying authority that says, you're going to submit your safety case to me for verification in a third party. Uh, validation. Um, and I think uh, that that's something that really is going to need to happen as more and more safety systems have to start entering the vehicle, especially for from a functional safety standpoint. Uh, I think we really need to have more of a uh, more of an oversight, if you will, to ensure people are following a consistent set of rules. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Uh, the next one uh, is for you, Bob. Uh, during your presentation, uh, you have uh, spoken about uh, your harm partnership. Um, and I, I have another g 798 hey, hey, uh, can you can you speak more about uh, your partnership with ARM? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the new announcement by ARM about the, the ARM Mali G, G78AE which stands for Automotive Enhancements, is a, a major breakthrough in uh, GPU technology because ARM are allowing flexi flexible partition, partition of GPU memory, which allows resolution of interference channels on, inside the GPU for safety certification. I mean, nobody has thought about this before. It's the first GPU to do this. As well as that, ARM will be providing um, 
ISO 26262 um, hardware data to allow the hardware to be certified as well, which is another important aspect. And the previous question about um, automotive certification being different from aerospace is correct because typically the manufacturers decide if the system goes live or not. There's no authority to challenge the manufacturers okay yeah, to the absolutely. system. Absolutely. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Okay, regarding the time, I think we will uh, conclude this uh, webinar now. Um, I want to thank you again, uh, you, Christopher and Bob, regarding your very interesting uh, presentation. Um, for all the questions we, we, we didn't answer, we will uh, do it directly by, uh, by email. Um, the presentation and the record of this presentation uh, will be uh, available I, I think uh, during uh, next week, so uh, you will be able to 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 get this uh, this presentation. Um, thank you again. Thank you for all the attendees uh, to have participated to this uh, webinar. Uh, stay safe and see you soon. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.